Hi, my name is Gerhard Schwant and welcome to Southern Power TV. Today we have the pleasure of speaking with Robert Cialdini. Yes. He's the author of a number of books. Uh, which is the last one? The last one was called Yes, but we have a new one coming out called The Small Big. It has to do with the smallest changes we can make in our persuasive approach that will produce the biggest likelihood of success. Well, you were speaking today at uh, Columbia University. Can we walk through some of the ideas that you have shared with Of you? course. When you present two options to a client, and one is more expensive than the other, which one should you present first? There's a clear answer to this. Present the more expensive one first, because if people say yes to that, there's frosting on everyone's cake. But if they say no, now you can retreat to the less expensive option, and people will want to retreat from their no to yes as a consequence. What are the two things that every salesperson could learn from by making a little change? One is a mistake we all make, which is to present all of our strongest arguments, our most positive features, our most compelling aspects of what we have to offer first. And then to say, but of course, this might be more expensive or this may cost a little more. By doing that, we haven't established our credibility that would go from mentioning a weakness in our case early. If we say, but of course, what I'm going to suggest might take a little more time. However, let me tell you the strengths of that case. Now you have established yourself as an honest, trustworthy person who's willing to talk about the negatives as well as the positives, and people will listen to the next thing you say differently. And that's the point for your strongest argument. Do you want to know where to put your strongest argument in a presentation? Immediately after you have mentioned a weakness. How do people learn those new concepts? So a lot of people, they hear you, they agree with you, they nod their hand, then they walk out the door and revert back to their old behaviors. Here's what we do at the end of every session. I give people a little laminated plastic card with the high points of my presentation on it that they can put in a pocket or a purse so that they don't have to carry the notes they took. They don't have to carry the book that I wrote. There's a little card with the highlights of my talk on it that they can take out of their pocket and say, oh, right, this is available to me now. Before I mention my strongest argument, I could mention a weakness and establish my credibility. So that provides a set of touchstones they can use. That's how we go from a good game plan to the execution of that game. Right. So there's also a phenomenon when people change physiology that their thought patterns change. Yes. For example, uh, there's a study that shows that if you ask people to take a pen and put it in their mouth like this, which causes their mouths to to constrict and they get a, a something of a con, uh, of a an angry look on their right. face. Right. Messages they hear under those circumstances are rejected. If you ask them instead to take that pen and keep their lips away from it, right. now their face is in a smile and they're more willing to accept the messages that they hear. Which strikes me as maybe the reason why humor works so well. But sometimes I think it's also a good idea when you come to sort of to an impasse and say, uh, let's get up and, and, and grab a drink over there. Yes, if you can break the set that they were in, if they were in a resistance set, break that and move somewhere else. I saw a new piece of that information that was very instructive. If a sales manager wants uh, people to be more uh, creative in a brainstorming session, take them to a room with a high ceiling because it's more open and expansive and that cue spurs more creativity. 
it's better to tell prospects or clients what they stand to gain by agreeing to a specific plan or what they stand to lose if they don't. So uh, explain that concept. The idea is loss aversion, and it's the basis of uh, Daniel Kahneman's award as the, for the Nobel Prize in Economics, his prospect theory. It shows that people are mobilized into action to a greater extent by the idea of losing something than gaining that very same thing. So as a salesperson, we are entitled to honestly tell people what benefits, what advantages they will forego if they fail to move in our direction. Not just what be benefits and advantages they will gain, right. but also what they will miss. That is more memorable, it's more mobilizing, it's more galvanizing of attention. So what do you think of the challenger sales concept? The challenger salesperson says, I have, I have researched your situation so well that I want to ask you some questions that perhaps you haven't asked and that seem relevant to your outcomes. So what that does is to say, I have put in the work ahead of time, which you, and then you get the rule for reciprocity. Okay, well, I, I am obligated to listen to you. But secondly, it says, I am knowledgeable about your case. I know some things because I've put in so much time. And now you have the, the, the credible authority right. who you want to listen to. Right. Makes great sense. But also, you, the underlying psychology is that uh, I want to help you prevent the loss. Prevent losses right. that you might be incurring without even knowing about. Yes. So, uh, let's look at the general population. There, there, there are really two categories. One, uh, that people worry about their income. And uh, the wealthier people worry about losing their wealth. So how does that play into sales? What, what you said was very interesting. I do some speaking for financial services mm -hmm. companies, and I talked about this loss aversion. Uh, people don't want to lose. The president of the company came up after my talk and he said, this explains something that my mentor told me when I was first starting out. He said, if you call a high wealth client and at three in the morning and say, if you act now, you'll be able to gain $25,000. He'll scream at you and hang up the phone. If you call him and say, if you act now, you won't lose $25,000. He will thank you. Do you believe that human behavior has not changed in the last hundred years? Or it hasn't? Human behavior has changed in a lot of ways. But there are some fundamental ways in which it has not changed. The human condition is pretty much the same, but technology has given us a very different way to have to handle the basic features of the human condition. The internet, for example. Right? So what we now have available to us is the ability to get information from peers all over the world simultaneously with a few key presses. So every peer is a university. Every peer, that's right. And now we can go uh, and check at on TripAdvisor or, or Yelp before we decide what to do in ways that we never could before. Peers are becoming the new authorities. Right. Yeah. So the question is, what behaviors have not changed? Well, the, the fundamental desire to seek peer information, okay. to seek um, scarce and rare opportunities, to behave in ways that are consistent with our existing commitments and priorities, right. to seek the counsel of genuine experts. None of those have changed. Right. What's changed is our ability to get access to those differentially. So what do you do to keep current and avoid being replaced by technology? Uh, in my case, I am always reading the latest psychological research. And what we've added to that recently is, which are the techniques that require the least effort and time and produce the biggest effects? And that's in the book. That's the new book. When is it coming out? 
September of this year, 2014. Awesome. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you.